Lily can feel a myriad of eyes on her for bringing her pet into the tavern, an oversight she quickly corrects, though not before he left a <laughs> sizable puddle of drool over the scent of what must be the fish of the day, accompanied by beans and baked bread. Tonight is cause for an informal celebration of sorts. A reunion at the office, albeit, well, out of the office as it were. As Lily approaches their room, she can hear little Red slamming a shoe on the bed frame, followed by a cry of triumph. She got the little bugger. A roach, of course. Lily lies and informs the ladies that, well, she's spoken to Mutamin about the condition of the room and... He's promised to do something about it, else the room is free. The dusty diviner, however, seems rather well, thrilled, mumbling about an opportunity to exercise some of her new talents. Lily still has no idea what she's talking about. No matter. Lily and Lanou share a bottle of Czar, while Little Red is spared the almond spirit, left to sip from a hand keg of Dragon's Breath beer sands a dark rye or Volo's dreaded death cheese. The dusty diviner hung her holy symbol about the bottle of czar, and curiously, not a roach bothered them the entire night. Without Lily's little lift, the Lady of Murder's learning to break trance to memorize spells in the middle of the night. It'd be perfectly peaceful, the only sound Little Red's breathing, were it not for the occasional snort from Leno. Inquisitor General Black and her holy defender are going to visit the cemetery outside of Luskin. Or so they thought. Just as she was about to leave, Lily hears a voice from behind. Yeah, I could hear that in the background. He said, you're in big trouble. Here's Lerner. There was a big fellow in here looking for someone exactly like you. Pretty sure it's you. Excuse me. Buddy of mine tells him to get lost and the big guys kill him for it. But all over. Yeah, curious what they divulged. My body didn't, but after I saw them all and split in half like that, I tells the guy you've been round these parts. I dare any man here to say I wouldn't have done the same thing right then. Well, I was about to leave. This orcish cultist must be the same one Ben Loren warned her about on the road north. Half-orc or full-blooded orc, Lily wonders. Not much difference, she imagines. Either way, they're known to abuse the more civilized rules of engagement to their advantage. In which case, she suspects it'll be an ambush, either in the wild at night or along some dark tunnel underground somewhere. Lily is no stranger to orcs or their half-orc brethren. She's heard plenty of stories and witnessed a few firsthand herself while walking the bustling harbors in the notorious and colorful dock ward of Waterdeep. This oldest and most lawless ward of the city is home to two barbaric gangs, the Black Boars and the Bull Elks. The Black Boars are led by Mirn Gunwin, an Aluskan human raised by the Thunder Beasts here in the north before returning to the City of Splendors. The Bull Elks, their rivals, are composed primarily of outcast Uthgar barbarians and brutish half-orcs. The name comes from the Bull Elk tribe, 
the name of a Tethyrian barbaric tribe that set Waterdeep ablaze in the year of the Shining Shield, over 500 years ago, when Waterdeep was known only as Nimor's Hold. You see, originally Waterdeep was only a small trading post on a deep water harbor, hence its name today, but was at that time seized by an Uthgard chieftain named Nimor the Reaver. And so, a few former Aluskan Reavers make up the gang's numbers as well today. The Bull Elks are led by Chief Hagar Bluebear Littwigson, a Hagspawn's son, banished by the Bluebear tribe at a young age. He was the child of Ludwig Longthrow, last chieftain of the Uthgar Bluebear tribe, and Tanta Hagara, an Annis hag who both deceived and served the tribe as a shaman at the time. Hagar's mother, by the way, went on to seize the fiend-ridden fortress of Hellgate Keep the year Lily stepped down from Candlekeep. Most of the notorious bull elks were abandoned by one Uthgurt tribe or another, like worm gods, banished for murder from the Great Worm tribe, or Reskin the Fanged, abandoned at birth by the Grey Wolf tribe. Imagine that, a half-orc werewolf. Lily certainly doesn't, which is why she never set foot in their favorite tavern either, the Bloody Fist off of Snail Street. A tavern so bad that they don't even bother putting out furniture anymore. Patrons are only trusted to drink at wall benches or at a stand-up elbow bar. And with wooden mugs only. Even the beer barrels are chained down to prevent their, well, use for unintended purposes. The owner? A Gluck Voral. You guessed it. A half-orc. Anyway, the Inquisitor General is finding no evidence of this orc or half-orc. He's apparently smart enough to stay outside the inn's walls. Inside the barn are just these foul-smelling and dumb-looking oxen. And rats, by the sound of it anyway. Otherwise, it's just the kind of storage you might expect to see at an inn. Firewood empty wine and beer barrels, and piles of lost and unclaimed cloaks, though nothing Lily would even want to dare touch, as they're probably home for the rodents that they can hear but don't see. So the Lady of Murder is in search of the Immiscarin Tome of Life. As has been mentioned, the Emiskaran Empire stretched over modern-day Thay, Mulharand, and Unther, but is now buried beneath the Roran Desert. It was, in fact, one of the first human empires of the Far Eastern lands. The Emiskar was a mysterious kingdom of power-mad artificers determined to achieve arcane supremacy. They used their magic to dominate others and even reached into other worlds to enslave the people there. While picking some fenberries from a bush, Lily notices a waterfall nearby and can't resist the temptation to take a closer look. The Emiskari wizards, emboldened by their successes, grew so arrogant and audacious that they dared to defy the gods, which is what ultimately led to their downfall, as in the end, the Empire's slaves, with the aid of their own deities, threw off the chains of their Emiskari masters and founded the modern dynasties of Mulharand and Unther. Interestingly enough, a group of Emiskari survivors sought refuge in the Underdark and eventually constructed a city called Deep Emiskar, sealed off from the outside world with ancient magic for a millennia of isolation. Until now, that is. Though knowledge of the city is wiped from the minds of would-be emigrants. Holy cow. <laughs> Here's a polar bear. 
wasn't quite expecting that. Here by the top of the falls. All right, crew. Let's take them down. Look at this. Two dire wolves behind it. It looks like Lanu cast uh, that stone skin or bark skin. I'm not sure. I think it scrolled away already. Lily loosens her grip on her polar bear's hot spellbook and her satchel. How thrilling! Not only to watch the brutal struggle of bear versus bear, but that the Lady of Murder should bag one for herself. The Company of Black will certainly be claiming a Todd to take back to Port Last. She wonders, though, given the Dar Wolves, if the nearby cave could in fact be the cave of the Black Wolf. There's even a recent fire pit nearby, likely set by Sir Carathis Ironheart and his boys, though there's no evidence to support it. Lily follows the cascading falls, wondering if they should dare enter what may be, if not a werewolf's lair, a wolf's den. Finding it hard to decide, distracted by thoughts of Tuolu. They should, or rather, there's no reason they shouldn't. She feels for the leaves of Belladonna in her satchel and fingers the pommel of Wolfsbane as they enter the mouth of the cave. Just a stray wolf here at the entrance. Probably two of them. A wolf's den, at least. Possibly both. It's worth further inquiry, at least. The nearby falls must also stream underground here, as there's the sound of rushing as well as dripping water. And the unmistakable howl of wolves. It's up to her fearless familiar to sniff out the remainder of the pack and maybe even their leader. I guess uh, Bones will probably take a bite. <laughs> and then uh, everybody else, I think, will run up. Hey, big dear. What can Whoops. I do? Wow, what happened to him? <laughs> Not doing well. Probably gonna lose bones soon. We'll be done. All right, crew. Let's take them down. It's not even clear how many are left. Yeah, 
Yeah, look at that. Sneaky and hiding in shadows. Yeah, what is that? I think that's... I think that's bark skin. <laughs> Lily starts to wonder if the black wolf and this orc cultist could be one and the same. Like that half-orc Raskin the Fanged of the Water Davian Bull Elks. It would explain the dried blood on his hands. Likely not the result of pummeling someone to death with his bare hands. Rather, the evidence of vicious clawing, albeit while shape change is a werewolf. If she had to guess, an outcast of the Uthgar Grey Wolf tribe. This area smells strongly of wolf, but has signs of human activity. Whatever lies here is not currently at home. <laughs> smells strongly of half orc barbarian werewolves, more like it. In a pile of debris are some bones, but the Inquisitor General can't tell if they're from little boys. There is, however, a scrap of parchment. Or right, here's a fragment of a journal. I have hunted him for years, and with a simple bite, he has turned me into the very thing I hate. I could not bear it if those boys remain werewolves. I shall go and try to discover what has happened to them. Until I find them, I'll not return to this cave, this prison where I must pay for my mistake. So Sir Carathas Ironheart has gone looking for the boys. Werewolves chasing werewolves. Ridiculous. No matter. If she's lucky, she'll find the knight, the boys, and even the black wolf all at once. A fabulous reunion, ripe for a glorious massacre at the hands of Portlast's true werewolf hunter, Inquisitor General Black. Lily finds traps and knocks as only a wizard can. <laughs> Yeah. 